Chapter Five, Book Two, of Rookwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Paul Curran. Rookwood, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Two, Chapter Five, The Captive. Black Will. Which is the place where we're to be concealed? Green. This inner room. Black Will. Tis well. The word is, now I take you. Arden of Feversham. Guarded by the two young farmers who had displayed so much address in seizing him, Luke, meanwhile, had been conveyed in safety to the small chamber in the eastern wing, destined by Mr. Coates, to be his place of confinement for the night. The room, or rather, closet, opening from another room, was extremely well adapted for the purpose, having no perceptible outlet, being defended on either side by thick partition walls of the hardest oak, and at the extremity by the solid masonry of the mansion. It was, in fact, a remnant of the building anterior to the first Sir Ranulph's day, and the narrow limits of Luke's cell had been erected long before the date of his earliest progenitor. Having seen their prisoners safely bestowed, the room was carefully examined. Every board sounded, every crevice and corner peered into by the curious eye of the little lawyer, and nothing being found insecure, the light was removed, the door locked, the rustic constables dismissed, and the brace of pistols having been loaded and laid upon the table, Mr. Coates pronounced himself thoroughly satisfied and quite comfortable. Comfortable. Titus heaved a sigh as he echoed the word. He felt anything but comfortable. His heart was with the body all the while. He thought of the splendour of the funeral, the torches, the illumined church, his own dignified march down the aisle, and the effect he expected to produce amongst the bewildered rustics. He thought of all these things, and cursed Luke by all the saints in the calendar. The sight of the musty old apartment, hung round with faded arras, which, as he said, smelt of nothing but rats and ghosts and such like varmint, did not serve to inspirit him, and the proper equilibrium of his temper was not completely restored until the appearance of the butler, with all the requisites for the manufacture of punch, afforded him by some prospective solace. "'And what are they about now, Tim?' asked Titus. "'As jolly as can be,' answered the domestic. "'Dr. Small is about to pronounce the funeral ration.' "'Devil take it!' ejaculated Titus. "'There's another miss. Couldn't I just slip out and hear that?' "'On no account,' said Coates. "'Consider, Sir Ranulph is there.' "'Well, well,' rejoined Titus, heaving a deep sigh and squeezing a lemon. "'Are you sure this is biling water, Tim? "'You know, I'm mighty particular. "'Perfectly aware of it, sir.' "'Ah, Tim, do you recollect the way I used to brew for poor Sir Piers, "'with a bunch of red currants at the bottom of the glass? "'And then to think that, after all, I should be left out of his funeral. "'It's the height of barbarity. "'Tim, this rum of yours is poor stuff. There's no punch worth the trouble of drinking except whisky punch. A glass of ripe pathine, straw colour, peat flavour, ten degrees overproof, would be the only thing to drown my cares. Any such thing in the cellar? There used to be an odd bottle or so, Tim, in the left bin, near the door. I've a notion there be, returned Timothy. I'll try the bin your honour mentions, and if I can lay hands upon a bottle, you shall have it. You may depend. The butler departed, and Titus, emulating Mr. Coates, who had already enveloped himself, like Juno, at the approach of Ixion in a cloud, proceeded to light his pipe. Luke, meanwhile, had been left alone without light. He had so much to meditate upon, and with naught to check the currents of his thoughts, he pensively revolved his present situation and future prospects. The future was gloomy enough the present fraught with danger, and now that the fever of excitement had passed, he severely reproached himself for his precipitancy. His mind, by degrees, assumed a more tranquil state, and, 
Exhausted with his great previous fatigue, he threw himself upon the floor of his prison-house, and addressed himself to slumber. The noise he made induced Coates to enter the room, which he did with a pistol in each hand, followed by Titus with a pipe and candle, but finding all safe, the sentinels retired. "'One may see, with half an eye, that you're not used to a feather-bed, my friend,' said Titus, as the door was locked. "'By the powers, he's a tall chap, anyhow. Why, his feet almost touched the door. I should say that room was a matter of six feet long, Mr. Coates.' "'Exactly six feet, sir.' "'Well, that's a good guess. Hang that ugly rascal, Tim. He's never brought the whisky. But I'll be even with him to-morrow. Couldn't you just see to the prisoner for ten minutes, Mr. Coates?' "'Not ten seconds. I shall report you, if you stir from your post.' Here the door was opened, and Tim entered with the whisky. "'Ah, my soul, Tim! And here you are at last. Uncork it, man, and give us a thimbleful. Blob, there goes the stopper. Here's a glass!' Smacking his lips. "'Whist, Tim, another drop. Stuff like this will never hurt a body. Mr. Coates, try it!' "'No, I thought you'd be a man of more taste.' "'I must limit you to a certain quantity,' replied Coates, "'or you will not be fit to keep guard. "'Another glass must be the extent of your allowance. "'Another glass! "'And do you think I'll submit to any such iniquitous proposition?' "'Beg pardon, gentlemen,' said Tim, "'but her ladyship desires me to tell you both "'that she trusts you will keep the strictest watch upon the prisoner. "'I have the same message also from Sir Ranulph. "'Do you hear that?' said Coates. "'And ah, what are they all about now, Tim?' groaned Titus. "'Just starting, sir,' returned Tim. "'And, indeed, I must not lose my time gossiping here, for I be wanted below. You must be pleased to take care of yourselves, gentlemen, for an hour or so, for there will be only a few womenkind left in the house. The storm's just over, and the men are all lighting their torches. Oh, it's a grand sight!' And off set Tim." "'Bad luck to myself, anyhow,' ejaculated Titus. "'This is more than I can bear. "'I have had enough of this watch and ward business. "'If the prisoner stirs, shoot him, if you think it proper. "'I'll be back in an hour.' "'I tell you what, Mr. Tyrconnell,' said Coates, "'coolly taking up the pistol from the table. "'I am a man of few words, but those few are, I hope, to the purpose. "'And I'd have you to know, if you stir from that chair or attempt to leave the room, damn but I'll send a brace of bullets after you. I'm serious, I assure you. And he cocked the pistol. By way of reply to this menace, Titus deliberately filled a stiff glass of whisky and water. That's your last glass, said the inexorable Coates. To return once more to Luke, he slept uneasily for some short space, and was awakened by a sound which reached his dreaming ears, and connected itself with the visions that slumber was weaving around him. It was some moments before he could distinctly remember where he was. He would not venture to sleep again, though he felt overwhelmed by drowsiness. There was a fixed pain in his heart, as if circulation were suspended. Changing his posture, he raised himself upon one arm. He then became aware of a scratching noise, somewhat similar to the sound he had heard in his dream, and perceived a light gleaming through a crevice in the oaken partition. His attention was immediately arrested, and placing his eye close to the chink, he distinctly saw a dark lantern burning, and by its light a man filing some implement of housebreaking. The light fell before the hard features of the man, with whose countenance Luke was familiar, and although only one person came within the scope of his view, Luke could make out from a muttered conversation that was carried on, that he had a companion. The parties were near to him, and though speaking in a low tone, Luke's quick ear caught the following. "'What keeps Jack Palmer, I wonder?' said one of the file. "'We're all ready for the fakement, props primed. I tell you what, Rob Rust, I've made my clasp knife as sharp as a razor, and damn, if Lady Rookwood offers any assistance, I'll spoil her taking in future. I promise you.' Suppressed laughter from Rust followed this speech. That laugh made Luke's blood run cold with his veins. Hark ye, Dick Wilder, you're a regular out-and-out, and stops at nothing. 
and curse me if I'd think any more of it than yourself. But Jack's as squeamish of blood, said as young miss that cries at a cut finger. It's the safer plan, say what you will, nothing but that will stop a woman's tongue. I shall make short work with her ladyship to-night, anyhow. Hist! Here Jack comes. A footstep crossed the room, and presently afterwards exclamations of surprise and smothered laughter were heard from the parties. Bravo, Jack! Famous! That disguise would deceive the devil himself! "'And now, my lads,' said the newcomer, "'is all right, right and tight. "'Nothing forgotten? Nothing. "'Then, off with your stamps, "'and on with your list slippers. Not a word. "'Follow me, and for your lives, "'don't move a step, but as I direct you. "'The word must be, "'Sir Piers Rookwood calls. "'We'll overhaul the swag here. "'This crap may make us all for life, "'and if you'll follow my directions implicitly, We'll do the trick in style. This slum must be our rendezvous when all's over. For hark ye, my lads, I'll not budge an inch till Luke Bradley be set free. He's an old friend, and I always stick by old friends. I'd do the same for one of you, if you were in the same scrape. So damn you, no flinching. Besides, I owe that spider shanked, snivelling split cause Coates who stands sentry a grudge, and I'll pay him off, as Paul did the Ephesians. You may crop his ears, or slit his tongue as you would a magpie's, or any other chattering varmint. Make him sign his own testament, or treat him with a touch of your habeas corpus act if you think proper, or give him a taste of blue plum. One thing only I stipulate, that you don't hurt that fat, mutton-headed broganeer. Whatever he may say or do, he's a devilish good fellow, and out of business. Saying which, they noiselessly departed, but carefully as the door was closed, Luke's ear could detect the sound. His blood boiled with indignation, and he experienced what all must have felt who had been similarly situated with the will, but not the power, to assist another, a sensation almost approaching to torture. At this moment a distant scream burst upon his ears. Another! He hesitated no longer. With all his force he thundered at the door. "'What do you want, rascal?' cried Coates from without. "'There are robbers in the house. Thank you for the information. There is one I know of already. Fool! They're in Lady Rookwood's room. Run to her assistance. A likely story, and leave you here. Do you hear that scream? Eh? What? What's that? I do hear something.' Here Luke dashed with all his force against the door. It yielded to the blow, and he stood before the astonished attorney. "'Advance a footstep, villain!' exclaimed Coates, presenting both his pistols, and I lodge a brace of balls in your head. Listen to me, said Luke. The robbers are in Lady Rookwood's chamber. They will plunder the place of everything, perhaps murder her, fly to her assistance. I will accompany you, assist you. It is your only chance. My only chance? Your only chance? Do you take me for a greenhorn? This is a poor subterfuge. Could you not have vamped up something better? Get back to your own room, or I shall make no more of shooting you than I would of snuffing that candle. Be advised, sir, continued Luke. There are three of them. Give me a pistol, and fear nothing. Give you a pistol? Ha! To be its mark myself. You are an amusing rascal, I will say. Sir, I tell you not a moment is to be lost. Is life nothing? Lady Rookwood may be murdered. I tell you, once for all, it won't do. Go back to your room, or take the consequences. By the powers! But it shall do, anyhow! exclaimed Titus, flinging himself upon the attorney, and holding both his arms. You've bullied me long enough. I'm sure the lad's in the right. Luke snatched the pistols from the hands of Coates. Very well, Mr. Tacconnell, very well, sir, cried the attorney, boiling with wrath and spluttering out his words. "'Extremely well, sir. You are not perhaps aware, sir, what you have done, but you will repent this, sir. Repent, I say. Repent was my word, Dr. T. Connell. Po, po, replied Titus. "'I shall never repent a good-natured action.' "'Follow me,' cried Luke. "'Settle your disputes hereafter. Quick, or we shall be too late.' Coates bustled after him, and Titus, putting the neck of the forbidden whisky-bottle to his lips, and gulping down a hasty mouthful, snatched up a rusty poker, and followed the party, with more alacrity than might have been expected from so portly a personage. End of chapter 5, 
Book Two.